It's been 57 years since General Odume Ojuku declared the sovereign state of Biafra, a consequence of the pogrom in northern Nigeria arising from the military coup and counter coup of January and July of 1966, respectively. Now, before the war, what was the place of Ndibo? And today, what is the place of Ndibo in today's Nigeria? And like someone would put it, let's find out where it started raining on Ndibo. This is the Eastern Eye. I am Alex Obodo. Welcome to the Eastern Eye on Afia TV, a program that X-rays the political, social and economic developments around us. Joining me tonight on the Eastern Eye is Comrade Fidelis Ede. He is the Executive Director, Service Accord Initiative. He's also a farmer, lawyer, and a former labor leader. Thank you so much, Comrade Ede, for joining me tonight on the Eastern Eye. Thank you for having me. So, the question would be, because a lot of people look like they started following what happened in Nigeria after the war. So, they didn't quite have a grasp of what may have been the place of Ndibo before everything came crumbling after the coup of January 1966. Before that time, what was the place of Ndibo? Were they doing well? Were they in prime positions in the uh, architectural and administrative setup of Nigeria? Well, I think uh, the Igbos have always uh, done well. And I don't think that uh, we should use the political setback as a standard for the contributions the Igbos have always made uh, in trying to make out a nation in this uh, complex according to uh, Professor, Professor Emeritus of UI, uh, Otete, where you have uh, 398 ethnic nationalities. Uh, if you look from the contributions the Igbos made, but mind you, when we talk about the Igbos, we are talking about those who in different fields of endeavor, made it by merit. Uh, the idea of uh, federal character uh, started taking place after the war, specifically from the 1979 uh, constitution. Uh, if we take a deep into history, if you look at the political struggle particularly the nationalist struggle, you will discover that uh, the Ubos had a prime position, whether you were looking at the social forces that brought about the awareness in terms of the regional uh, configurations. The Ubo Union was formidable, of which uh, the late Nambi Azikiwe was at the time the national president before uh, Obi, Zach Obi took over. But if you get to the political struggle, one thing that defines the Yubo man is that if you look at 1923, I don't want to deep before the amalgamation, uh, the eastern province and the struggle that the white man had to engage, the last bit being to subdue what is today, the Southeast. Uh, the North, the West, because of the structure of the cultural and religious um, governance and uh, spirituality, it was easy because of central uh, leadership they have, either as Emir, as or Oba. But when you now look at the then Eastern province and uh, the, the impact of colonial administration from 1891 and what later emerged 
as eastern region. If you match the south, south, and southeast, that is what is represented now. And look at the various expeditions conducted by the white man and why he took them over 21 <laughs> in just what you have now as the core southeast, uh, starting from the expedition that was basically conquer, uh, to conquer the arrow, then uh, coming home here, getting to Anisha and all that. But I want us to look at Nigeria from 1914 up to 23, 1923, when the colony of Lagos as a crown has started emerging as um, a political hotspot for the African tendency. And by 1923, Herbert Macaulay had already, had already cast a niche for himself. That was the year Zeke left for further studies abroad. If you fast forward, how Macaulay, who had cast his niche, and Zeke coming back to now be the general secretary of NCNC in 1944, you can now see the level of awareness, the level of um, enthusiasm the Igbos had in trying to make out what today we call Nigeria. There was this period that Nigeria was going to be a great nation, a nation where all the tribes will have uh, say, and by 1954, the Richard Constitution, in that constitution, it was acknowledged that there are three main tribal groups, the northern region, the western region, you know, the Yorubas, the House of Fulani, and the Igbos, that in whatever constitution you have to make, that they must be taken into consideration. That was a defining point. If you also look at the Minority Commission report of 1957, the world uh, that was headed by Wilkin, Henry Wilkin, it acknowledged that in the then what I imagine that eastern region of the population that it was had the majority, I think 17 point something million. So if you also look at the fact that at independence, the pre-independent constitution, one, there was no contest as to who was to be the father of the nation representing the Queen of England. Uh, Zika emerged as the governor general. But outside that, if you look at the, const the election that brought about uh, the first independence election, that was 59. The impact of the NCNC, National Council of Nigeria and Cameroon, was so huge and widespread that the, even the government that uh, was produced by uh, MPC uh, had a minority because they were able just to have their votes uh, in the northern region. Then the West also had their own uh, votes in the Russian, uh, northern, uh, western region. Zeke, who was the leader of NCNC, had a spread that gave them six ministers in the eastern region and the western region. So the point I'm trying to make is that politically, before independence, the woman was not just a nationalist, but the woman was the man leading what was then and remained the only true national political party. Because if you look at what emerged, once you talk about the action group, we know uh, the coverage. Once you are talking, in fact, the NMPC had no pretension as to that their consign was That's just the, the, NPC, letter, yeah. Uh, yeah. the NPC, had no pretension as that they are consigned was about the northern region. So from the political angle, the contribution of the Igbo was huge in terms of trying to build a true Nigeria. If you also look at the economic angle, uh, we cannot, apart from uh, the, the, the first 
millionaire, Rashid, who was um, a free slave and came in and uh, played politics, uh, economic policy that saw him ahead. Any other Nigerian in terms of indigenous Nigeria was uh, uh, Odumeko Ujugo in terms of Sydney Park. Just like when you talk about uh, the University of Nigeria as the first indigenous uh, university. We know that University of Ibadan came, but it was an outpost of uh, the London university. Uh, university. So when you look at the contributions of the Indigo in terms of merit, you will discover that they maintained a first position out of merit contribution and education. Uh, the first uh, military general was Agui Rensi. Incidentally, which was also a testament of the contributions of Ondibo, the first vice chancellor of Lagos, University of uh, Lagos was Igbo. The first vice chancellor of University of Ibada was Igbo. And if you look at the role of Ndibo in terms of commerce, it was widespread. The Igbos at no point were restricted to just uh, the eastern region. So the Igbos has always been central. The Igbos have always been national. The Igbos have always believed in Nigeria emerging as not just a democratic nation, but a nation that ought to be a respected nationwide, worldwide, a, 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 a nation that has started as early as um, anybody can think of to export, uh, whether it was in the legal field, whether it was in sports, whether it was in diplomacy, something we started harvesting after the war. So the Igbo's contribution before the war was huge and was also even acknowledged by the colonial government. Mm. All right, thank you so much for taking your time to lay all this out for us. And I'd like to ask you specifically, by the time it was 1966, it, it looked like all hell was let loose. And they looked like whatever gains Ndibo made crumbled at that point. But did it crumble completely? Or did, did Ndibo retain some of the vestiges of their interests on a national united Nigeria? Well, the truth of the matter is that when you look at the impact of the Civil War, it uh, degraded everything that the Igbos believed in. Because to retain means to remain stationary in where you think you've made gain. You know, the first impact of the little uh, Civil War was that the Igbos had to leave where they were known, where they had made impacts to return to uh, their home, where before then they didn't quite give the attention that was needed. And uh, it was obvious that he was being nationalist, looked at Nigeria as a nation where where you find yourself is where you have to defend, where you have to grow, where you have to prosper. Uh, if you put it uh, in the Igbo balance, the Igbos pursued the doctrine of Ebo Nyebi, Konawachi. So when people left the war as a disruptive um, incident, as an amputation, if I must use that, that uh, word. It was obvious that there was no way the center could hold. So even those who found themselves in the South, uh, what you now know as Southeast, uh, had to receive those who were coming back in droves. And uh, managing war situation is not as if uh, you were managing normalcy. It was disruption. So the Igbos lost all, uh, if not most, of what made them Nigeria. And uh, after the war, they had to also like start from the scratch. But the spirit 
of um, doggedness, the spirit of innovation, the spirit of never say die, the spirit of perseverance, the spirit of uh, believing in the fact Nigeria is a place that must guarantee sense of belongingness to everybody, made them to begin to return to even where they had been wounded out, to even where they were being rejected, and that has remained the plight and the fate of the average Yubo man. But in politics, you will discover that the reforms that took place in politics also gave them a space. Uh, what is this space? If you look at the politics of uh, the post-Civil War, uh, the pre-Civil War politics, you will discover that parties restricted themselves to their regions. And it, it did not matter whether um, you, you needed to converse for vote elsewhere. But the parliamentary system and the way the constitution was designed allowed just simple majority, even if it has come from only your zone. And that was why it was possible for the NPC to have produced the prime minister, even when you had that the NCNC, like I said earlier, had a wider vote spread, you know, which if it was today, it would have been impossible because NCNC would have been the one that would have had the two uh, positions, two third majority votes. But with the reform that was brought about by the General Obasanjo, General Motala Obasanjo government, it became necessary and it became expedient that a political party had to win to third in order to constitute the federal government. First, it's not even to win. They must have a party representation before the election, before they will now be registered. So when the 1979 campaign and the election came, one of the things that happened was that after the election, despite the fact that the Supreme Court had declared NPN, the National Party of Nigeria, to have won the presidential election, it was still necessary that an accord, just like they had in 1959, because it was an accord that gave uh, NCNC the opportunity that it had in its ministerial dispensation. So in 79, a similar repeat of the same accord came. But one thing that is striking is not just that the position the Igbo secured, but it is that at every given time, the Igbo has always played to give political parties in Nigeria that national semblance in terms of accord. And it was that accord with MPN, despite the fact that Ekweme, Alex Elete Ekweme, was the vice president of MPN. You discover that it was that accord that also gave us, uh, through Edwin Umezueke, the Speaker of House of uh, Representatives, apart from other ministerial positions we also secured. So what am I alluding to, or what am I speaking to, is that the Igbo has always played to make Nigeria a nation state, a Nigerian where every tribe will thrive. Imagine if uh, the late Nnam Diazikiwe, Dr. Nnam Dia, had not always lent that support in terms of accord, you would have discovered it would have been impossible to forge that kind of national sense of belonging, that kind of cohesion politically. Because without political cohesion, it will be impossible to have a government that have respect, to have a government that will control loyalty, to have a government that will be able to conduct governments as a federal government. Mm. So that was what happened. So now, with all that that we saw in, in the late 70s and up to the early part of the uh, 80s, what now changed after the military took back power? I think it was uh, uh, Buhari that came on board. And uh, what changed between when Buhari took power and when it came back to the civilians in 1999? I'm, I'm, of course, I know there were a few attempts in between for a transition, but it didn't work. But by the time 1999 came, what changed the worldview of Ndibo politically in Nigeria? Well, 
you see, um, in every society, you will discover that uh, the dominant contradiction usually will affect the psyche of a political narrative in which those who are led consciously or unconsciously have to queue in. Because if you look at 79, the narrative I gave, but for the interruption and the military coup that came, uh, it would have been impossible for the system to have stopped Alexei Kweme from taking over from Shagari. And if you look at the political narrative in terms of alliances, you will discover that it has always been alliance between, in fact, not between. The North has always find it more friendly to work with Indibo. Because when we now talk, we are talking about the Southeast, knowing that the creation of states came at the eve of the Civil War. So what changed? What changed is that first, there is this mentality that came after the Civil War. Then there is this narrative that came with the... Uh, you know, the fact that the Igbos were defeated during the war. But that narrative didn't take deep role until PDP lost the election. Because, like I told you, if you look at the 1999 process that brought Obasanjo, Obviously, uh, people thought that uh, Ekweme, by even his role, the role of Ndibo, mind you that the political process, when Abubakar announced the transition, after the whole confusion that started from IBB, then Abacha took over, then the sudden death of Abacha, people didn't quite believe given what Nigerians had gone through politically, that Abubakar was going to allow transition within one year. So there was this labor, there was this withdrawment, which the core political uh, class had, not just in Igbo land, but it was widespread, because at that point, the political uh, leaders and actors talk about the Equimels, talk about uh, Yaradua, talk about Abiola and what have you, who as a then had died, you know. So people had suspicion. People didn't quite believe the system. So another class of people who were not part of the mainstream of the political process of the Second Republic were thrown up. People who didn't even have the consciousness which the Igbos had before the war and after the war. So, and I think that when they got this position, it was difficult for them to align the position they were holding with the consciousness that Igbos had before the war and the consciousness that emerged when Ekweme emerged as vice president and uh, Edwin Umezuke as speaker of the house. Because you will recall that even when the late uh, Ikemba came back, People thought that Ikemba was going to move into MPP. But he moved into MPN, despite the fact that he lost the uh, senatorial election in the Anambra uh, South then. It was very easy that the MPN, as a national government, was still impacting on Indibo. That was the election that produced the late CCO. No. But Following the military coup, another crop of people that weren't part of that process and the consciousness came in. And for me, I think what it was like, they got into an arena, they first were not too sure they were uh, got in. And when they got there, it was like, ah, 
how do we manage this? And all of a sudden, they reduced the quality of political representation, the quality of political participation, and the alliances which enabled the Indi Boten network to be able to capture this uh, narrative. In uh, 1994, in the Ahajoku lecture, uh, in his paper, Professor Emmanuel uh, Obiechina had likened this uh, narrative and I gave now to an American folklore. He said there was this guy that was called uh, Rip uh, Van Weekly who had a farm and he left his farm and went tending to other people's farms. Farm. And by the time he returned, we took, we had took over you know, yeah, his farm. I, so I, I, I think that's what happened to us. And yes. since then, you can see that the quality of representation yes. and Debo became low. And that brought us into the marginal mentality of marginalization. All right, we will pick on that marginalization talk when we come back from this break here on the Eastern Eye. Stay with us. You're welcome back to the Eastern Eye here on IFIA TV. It's a program that x-rays the political, social, and economic developments around us. And today, we're taking a look at the Biafra struggle and the place of Ndibo in today's Nigeria. And I have in the studio with me tonight, graciously, of course, yeah. he's joined me tonight, Comrade Fidelis Ede. Thank you so much for uh, coming tonight, especially on an auspicious day like this. So you touched on the issue of marginalization. And uh, I always say this, that uh, the reason why we saw racism was because there was uh, slave trade. That was the consequence of racism. And then in Nigeria, we see that the consequence of the civil war is marginalization. So how do you think that Ndibo are dealing with this marginalization? Well, I, I think the, 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 the point I was trying to make earlier is that marginalization is um, real and perceived. But we have a group of people whose perception of marginalization have not only become defeatist, but has also even denied them the ability to begin to even say, I am Igbo. If you dip into history, one of the challenges the colonial master had was that they were not quite able to understand at the earlier stage when they were trying to occupy this um, space we are now as in the Igbo, that Igbos were Republican. And when people liken Republican to independent mindedness, I think they miss the point. Because if you look at the traditional Igbo setting, the villages, the communities, the way decisions are made, you will discover it is even deeper than the Greek mobler from where uh, they said we borrowed democracy. Why did I say that? The Greek mobler people didn't not don't always refer to the fact that only the property class only men who had vested interests in the community gathered the square to make decisions it is not so in the Igbo traditional setting in the Igbo traditional setting families send representatives women had their role and that was why it was easy in 1929 to have their about oh, uh, women's riot when the issue of taxation came up. The people that are subdued, the people who are not giving space to participate in economic activity. Mind you, you have to conquer the social before you get to the economic. If from the point of the economic that the political, which is about equality, comes in. So if we had women by 1929 who were participating in economic activities and started questioning the political authority of the colonial man. That means that the Igbo setting, apart from being democratic, was also assertive. That is what is missing today. 
People just talk about marginalization. But again, the, the contradiction I was trying to talk about is the marginal mentality whereby we'll find ourselves. Because when we talk about the Igbo's role in Nigeria, at no time have the Igbo space been grasher. If you talk about Agui Ronsi, at no point was he appointed governor, um, the, 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 the general officer commanding the army because he's Igbo. It was by merit. If you talk about Zeke, I made the point that by 1923, Habab Macaulay had dominated Lagos politics. That was the year Zeke left for further studies. But by 44, 1944, Zeke had emerged general secretary of NCNC and later the president. You can also move down until the uh, tribal unions were banned. The Igbo State Union was so formidable in Nigeria that the Igbos, anywhere they resided, had protection. They were caring for Igbos wherever they found themselves because they were members of the branches. So how did we now get to the point that even the political spaces, the political authority we have, is no longer impacting on our people. If you look at the governance authorities in Nigeria, today we have 811. You have 774 local governments. We have our own share. We have 36 states. We have our own share. Then you have one federal government. No matter how you want to define marginalization, we still get our ministerial slots by virtue of the federal character. You may begin to talk about whether we have the grid, A, ministries or not. But under Obasanjo, we had it all. At a point, we had central bank governor, we had minister for finance, finance and coordinating minister. The so the question will be, how have these authorities for governance and the improvement of the economic maybe of Ndibu have been deployed? This is the question we ask to be asking. How do we find our local governments? In the same region, you'll find what you'll find in the north. Minus the communal spirit of Ndibo, of always providing for themselves, you will discover that governance is absent in terms of impact. So how did we get to a point that we hardly question those who find themselves in spaces? I do not care whether we say that people are Jebego. I do not care whatever you want to define. But are we still the same people that have a feeling that we are marginalized as a result of the civil war? Now, if you talk about marginalization, we are not the first. You may want to look at uh, the biblical story of uh, the Jew or the Jews as where well. it was read in the Bible. But is the Holocaust not real? Was this state of Israel not a product of 1948? Have they always been there? How have they emerged? By the virtue of that, that they have always been in war, have you degraded what they represent in the nation of state? Rather, the Israels have been the ones that have lived out the Igbo saying, no nyendiro buru. And they have not even degraded democracy in their place. There will be war, and they will still be talking about the attitude of the prime minister. And they will still be talking about whether he will be impeached. So the standard of governance is not degraded by the fact that Israelites have enemies around them. Take the Japanese. Do you find another nation that have suffered what they suffered as a result of their defeat? In the Second World War, they have their two major cities bombed. At the end of '45, America and the Allied forces were occupying the nation called Japan. They controlled their military. They took over their economic structures. And today, Japan emerged as a world technological noted nation. You cannot talk about any technological development in the world without reference to Japan. You talk about the Italian Germans after the war in the US, the level of marginalization they suffered. 
What did they do? They were unduly taxed, they were wounded, they were not respected by their right. They didn't go lamenting, they didn't go shouting. What they did was to sit back and say, okay, apart from the angle of the mafia, the one they did that remained legacy in America is that they decided to move into legal education. Today, you hardly can find a district where you cannot identify, that I'm talking about America, where you don't find an Italian as a magistrate or an attorney. So why have we become so laid back? Why is it, technologically speaking, we have universities of technologies. What have they done? People will tell you, ah, Pruda, they are not allowed to uh, operate since after the war. But go to coal camp. What is it you want in coal camp that you cannot find? Where is, why is there no synergy between coal camp and our universities of technology? Why is Yaba College of Tech more pronounced than IMT Enugu when we are told that IMT was fashioned after an American Technological Institute. So what is that thing that the Mbundibos are denied in terms of our ingenuity that Nigerians are stopping us? Why is it in politics where we talk about, ah, this ministry will not be allowed to run it, the ones we run? For instance, do we need an attorney general of the Federation to go to courts? to challenge that governors should allow the local governments to run. One would expect that such suit will not include states that are in Southeast. But in the same Southeast, we've had governors that run their tenure without allowing local government, as allowed in the Constitution to run. As you find local government in some other northern states, in some states as conduit, that's the same thing we'll find in Southeast. So what is it? that a typical Igbo man that is in politics is bitter about with the defeat of the civil war and the superstructure of marginalization that they are giving to the Igbos, such that at a point we now say this is what we've done for ourselves. If the federal government had allowed us, maybe we would have done more. That's the question. And that is the aspect I will talk about marginal orientation that have compounded the marginalization of the war. So typically now, uh, what is it that needs to be done, especially within the southeastern space, to change that awareness and bring Ndibo to a new awareness? Well, I, I think what needs to be done is that we must uh, start from personal introspection, what I call self-reflection. There is a narrative that has been so misaligned and perverted that the Igbos will usually, for everything that happened today, we will want to attribute it to the federal government without even acknowledging. Alex, though uh, it was not the best under Buhari, but again, nobody remembered that Buhari's first two attempts for presidency that Buhari chose Igbo men for vice president. No, no, they, they, our thought didn't even go there. When Buhari was uh, uh, president, the attorney general under him was an Igbo man. We, you see, you need diplomacy and you need to acknowledge the Igbo will always say, no to Edikon and Kome, or Moza. We cannot just rise and uh, attack a tribe or a class and think that we will make profit by it. And it started by, it became worse when PDP lost the presidency. If you look at the political trajectory, the fact that Jaradoa died may have been partly responsible for what uh, we'll find ourselves. But it became worse when, we have to say this, uh, because it is there in the record, when uh, President Jonathan couldn't keep to the agreement he had with the North. Because people will tell you, no, he had a right to contest yeah. for second term. Yes. Yeah, that is that. But Obasanjo as the president, 
or to had a right to have manipulated the constitution. We saw it in some other African countries, and it resulted in war. But when the second term was not, when the third term of Basanjo was not going, what did he do? He stepped aside, picked Yaradua and Jonathan, and that was how they emerged. If Jonathan had stepped aside and had picked uh, Natana, there was no way and Igbo wouldn't have been vice president. And there was no way Ibuari would have been president with the alliance they had with the West. It has never happened. That is the first time in Nigerian political history an alliance was consummated between the North and the West. It has never happened. And mind you, that Ibuari is not a product of the mainstream political structure of the North. And if you had listened to the Lamidos, uh, to the core politicians in the PDP, you would have discovered that they were shouting that this is not the agreement, this is not the agreement. And there was no way a Northerner would have emerged in PDP without a vice president from the core Southeast. So what we need to do now is to look at the political trajectory and to begin to realign. I think that's what we need to do now because the whole thing we are discussing is politics. It is not the economic angle. It is not the educational angle. It is not even the religious angle. But the politics being the superstructure that influences the other structures, it is important we get our reading right now and we learn not to put all our eggs in one basket. And one point I keep making is that no matter what people think of Tinubu, he kept faith. He followed an ideology because if Tinubu had pandied to Basanjo's plea and um, political calculation in his second tenure, when they, 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 they floated the idea that Obasanjo was uh, being um, uh, ridiculed, that he was a president without a constituency and had wooed the West to come into PDP, and Tinubu had backed out and used his AD to win Lagos. If that had not happened, we wouldn't have a Tinubu that would have had an alliance with Buhari, which eventually paid off. Because politics beyond just interest, there are moral angles. There are things that people keep to. There are people that keep agreements. There are people that play politics to the point of no, that politics is whatever comes. But there are people that say, no, I have a commitment to this. And I think that is the commitment Zeke maintained as a nationalist in finding out what is the central interest that Nigeria has to benefit from. If you look at all his political concessions, whether where he decided to be governor general, when he decided to leave the Senate presidency, where he decided to align with MPN that gave MPP the job. Mind you, it was not him. It was all, always securing Fondibo. So this is the time. We must also look at what does this politics represent now for us? And how do we go about it? It's a dilemma. And let me tell you why I felt that we didn't quite also play it well. We have about a minute and a half. You see, when the idea of the presidency coming to the South was being pounded. I felt that we, our politicians needed to be bold to say, no, it is not South. It ought to have been Southeast, not Central and not East. Those who had a different agenda were those who played the Southern presidential politics. Because if we had been if we had followed equity and we had said zones that had not produced presidents, it could have been southeast, north central, and north east. And if that game has played, what it means is that if the north had taken it, any of the northern states, the southeast would have taken the vice president. These are calculations nobody will go far to find. You know, we are totally out of time, but I'm enjoying this conversation, and I think we'll have an encore. Thank you so much, Comrade Fidelis Ede. My honor. For talking to us tonight on the Eastern Eye. Comrade Fidelis Ede is the Executive Director of Service Accord Initiative, a former lawyer, 
and former Labour leader. He's also Ezudo Nuboka. Thank you. My honour. Thank you so much. And that's Eastern Eye for today. And before I go, I have to say this, that we, are, we pay our respects to all the fallen heroes of Biafra, those who lost their lives during the war between 1967 to 1970. Our hearts are with everyone who's lost someone and whose lives changed forever because of it. My name is Alex Obodo. Good night. Thank <music> you.